Um, hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you for coming um, and joining us in the third and final webinar of the uh, webinar series under the NIHR's Children, Health and Maternity Programme. Um, this webinar is called Emotions and Public Involvement. Um, on top of that, um, I want to um, just make a few acknowledgements before we start and introduce ourselves. We will be bringing up some sensitive topics today, so please look after yourself and another and do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable. Um, so I'm Naomi Morley. I'm a researcher at the University of Exeter and I work in the patient and public involvement team for the Applied Research Collaboration Southwest Peninsula. It's PENARC for short, my favorite um, acronym. Um, so Mary, my co-host, and I have met through a community of practice, which is sort of an interest group um, around public involvement in the children's health and maternity theme. And we've been putting these webinars together. Um, Mary, do you want to introduce yourself here? Thanks, Naomi. So, yes, I'm Mary Newburn. I'm a service user researcher and I, I lead up the um, public involvement for the Applied Research Collaboration, or ARC for short, in um, South London. And we have a, a public involvement strategy meeting once a year when we sort of ref reflect on what we've been doing and um Latterly, we've we've had some external speakers to sort of stimulate a bit of thinking um, and, and learn from what they've been doing. And one of the things that came up last November was that um, people felt there was a need for more support and opportunities for learning from other people and, and peer support and sharing. Um, particularly for those um, public involvement leads who came from a service user background or a public background and who were not um, researchers and part of an academic um, or part of a university and uh, unemployed there. Um, but we recognise that we've all got a lot in common, whether we're doing public involvement uh, as part of um, being an academic, a researcher, or, or coming from a, a service user kind of perspective. Um, and you, we've, we thought we'd put on these webinars. I approached Naomi and we thought we'd, we'd run three, um, which were now on the third, uh, and they seem to have been very well received. Uh, and we're very much learning as we go. We're very keen to have feedback from all of you about how you find today's webinar and what you feel your needs are for mutual support, being signposted to information or, or anything else that's important to you. So that's the background. Thank you so much for coming today. We've got three fantastic presentations and, and four speakers all together, um, including uh, somebody speaking from a um, public or service user perspective. Um, so, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Mary. Um, just a little bit uh, around this topic, why we have put this on today. Um, we shaped the webinars from the needs and the conversations that have emerged from um, our group and our wider networks. And this one in particular stems from our conversations about the value of allowing space for emotions in research. Um, emotions traditionally have quite a negative connotation in research. It, to make research robust, we, we, we are told to be critical and separate knowledge from emotions, but this does not allow or does not take into consideration that um, people that are sharing through lived experience, um, this lived experience is often deeply tied to emotions and it's expressed in that way. And so when we're meeting together and when we're sharing knowledge, um, these emotions are felt by public uh, members and also by researchers and simply to disregard them uh, might be harmful and inequitable. Um, so today we were looking forward to hear from our guest speakers of their approaches and the learning of, of, around emotions in research and public involvement and hoping to hear from your reflections as well in the breakout rooms. Um, um, Mary, do you want to introduce our speakers? Yes, I'd love to. Um, 
So our first speaker today is, is Lauren Azare, who is a research assistant working at PenArc. And we're really delighted to hear about the literature review that you've been working on. And I'm going to keep the introduction short so you've got maximum time. And we've got 20 minutes, so um, we hope there'll be Q&A time when you finish presenting. Over to you. Thank you, Mary. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to this webinar this more uh, well this afternoon. And thank you also to Naomi and Mary for inviting me. Um, as Mary introduced a moment ago, I just wanted to do a quick presentation for you on reviewing the literature on the role of emotions in public involvement. My name is Lauren Asari, and I work uh, with Naomi in the PenArc Patient and Public Involvement Team. But without further ado, let's get into it. So firstly, an introduction. Uh, the idea for this conceptual review came about after an experience of high emotions during a PPI meeting with some of my colleagues who helped uh, also put this review together. So of course, it wasn't that this was the first time that emotions had ever been experienced in PPI, but my colleagues recounted that on this occasion, it was almost like the emotions were so high in this meeting that you couldn't not notice them. You know, understandably so. Uh, the topic was heavy and the experiences shared were deeply personal. But that got the team thinking about how emotions can help to shape the conversation around the research in question. And so two things were noted during this meeting. Firstly, the emotion seemed to strengthen the impact of what people shared. And secondly, that it also seemed to bring the group closer together. Um, I also just wanted to take this moment to mention that a few of the collaborators on the exchange patient and public involvement group uh, during which this meeting was had helped us to put together this review. So many thanks to our public collaborators in that group, but in particular to Phil Ruthen, Pamela Staunton and Julia Burton for their insight, which helped to shape this review. So coming up, I wanted to first speak to you a little bit more about the review itself. Secondly, about some of the outside of the box thinking that you might say that helped to shape the rest of this review. Thirdly, about one particular key theme, um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about it later. And lastly, about some of the ways forward that we both identified from the texts that we reviewed, but also from our shared collaboration and learning that we got. So firstly, about the review. Uh, now that you know a little bit about the background of this conceptual review, I wanted to talk you through a little bit more of the process. So firstly, there was the screening process. Uh, we conducted a structured scopus, skirt, uh, scopus search, gosh, say that five times fast, in November 2021 and December 2022. And through this search, we identified 18 articles that we ended up using in the review. Secondly, we conducted a thematic analysis by tabulating the uh, recurring themes that seemed to pop up a lot in the literature. We also complemented this with some theory generating articles that related to the role of emotion and emotional labor in human life more generally, which we identified from previous work that um, myself and my colleagues have done within the team, um, along with also some of the learning that our public collaborators have also done outside of uh, PPI, but a little bit more on that later. So next is the outside the box thinking. Basically, this is just about what the other disciplines um, outside of health research might say about the role of emotions more generally speaking. Um, so as I mentioned a moment ago, there was a range of different expertise within the review team. Um, and this included the public collaborators that helped with this review. And this enabled us to engage creatively with the topic area and view the role of emotions in PPI through numerous different lenses. Um, some of these key lenses through which we viewed emotions in PPI sparked discussion around the following concepts. 
So firstly, sociology, which is um, my original academic background. There are some theories that uh, suggest that we try to regulate our feelings to fit with the norms of a particular situation. And this strikes similarity to uh, sociologists Mead and Cooley's thoughts on symbolic interactionism. So symbolic interactionism basically just refers to the idea that showing emotions can serve the purpose of unconsciously conveying understanding and rapport to others. Secondly, we also looked at uh, some viewpoints from literature and the arts. Uh, some writers suggest that the lingering emotions that one could feel after a difficult experience transform into the somewhat impersonal and objective, uh, quote unquote, experiential evidence that's required in PPI project settings. Uh, this was a point that was brought to us by one of our public collaborators, who's actually an author. And writer T.S. Eliot suggests that poetry, for example, is not a medium to unleash raw emotion in an artless or uncontrolled and undisciplined way. And hence, he maintains that poetry is not a turning of loose emotion, perhaps in the same way that PPI meetings, while emotional at times, are not necessarily spaces free of emotion. Um, they're not spaces, rather, for emotion to be expressed freely and can instead be places where emotion is used for something. Thirdly is psychology, um, which represents the background of one of the uh, researcher reviewers on this project, uh, Dr. Joe Day. Carl Jung's wounded healer theory came up a little bit in the analysis of our papers, and it could serve as a suggestion for why researchers and public collaborators get into PPI in the first place. Um, in more PPI relevant terms, the researchers own personal wounds, which may be their motivators for getting into PPI research to begin with, may be activated when public collaborators share their experiences, particularly if the researcher can relate to them in some way. This theory suggests that the researcher might unconsciously pass this empathy back to the public contributor, causing a bond to be formed. Uh, and I would think that this is quite similar to how emotions showed during the meeting that inspired this review caused the group to become closer, like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. So next we move on to some of the key themes. We initially went into this review trying to see how various authors defined emotions in PPI, but we didn't really find any explicit definitions nor much of a consensus. So instead, a number of uh, recurring themes showed up in the literature, and I wanted to look into what was arguably the strongest recurring theme across the literature with you today. So that would be that emotions can be viewed as challenging to PPI, but also in PPI. And I'll get into a little bit more of what that means in a second. So the first thing that comes under this is managing group dynamics. Some studies noted that managing group dynamics could be difficult, where people worked through information at different speeds, which led to frustration within the research and the PPI group. Um, this is something that I think I also can resonate with in terms of some of my own experiences working with PPI groups. But one particular paper um, from uh, researchers Mitchell et al. Uh, noted that for PPI facilitators, managing the emotions of all of those involved in this process could also be both draining and emotionally challenging, particularly at the start of um getting into these sorts of difficult conversations when people start sharing their experiences. This is a quote from that paper that says that there were a lot of tears actually in that first meeting. It was very emotional in the first two meetings, etc. The next thing that I wanted to shine a light on is the exposing and vulnerable nature of sharing and having emotions during PPI meetings. And due to the exposing and vulnerable nature of uh, sharing difficult experiences, usually within a group setting, some researchers in our review also noted that significant difficulties may arise among public collaborators when one of them has a crisis either during or outside of PPI meetings. 
This could be attributed in part to the dredging up of painful memories that can come with sharing emotions or indeed be preceded by sharing said emotions. And another paper in this review included uh, and contained an excerpt from a PPI collaborator's thoughts on emotions in PPI, which covered the reflections on how doing PPI can indeed dredge up painful memories for both researchers and collaborators. And shed light on what I think is an important part of nuance that says that, you know, you may be able to cope with sharing said emotions in that meeting or that particular sort of uh, structured setting, but then it sets off more sad reflections when you leave the meeting. Um, for collaborators in particular, reading transcripts after meetings can serve as a form of an emotional burden as well, because it serves as a reminder. So this is all quite doom and gloom, but that's not at all the picture that I want to paint of emotions in PPI, because a particularly poignant reflection that came from reviewing the literature was that some public collaborators felt that taking part in the discussions presented an opportunity for them to talk about and process their emotions together with a group of peers who knew what it was like from firsthand experience to go through these things. It was considered an emotional relief and felt liberating for these collaborators. And that's why it's so important that we make space for emotions in PPI. And that leads me on to my last section, which is about the ways forward. Uh, so you may be wondering after going in depth into what we ended up seeing uh, popping up throughout the literature, what are some of the ways forward that we've identified from this review? So we concluded that there's a need to make space for the variety of intense emotions that can be present within PPI. And we propose that this can be done in part by firstly, having supportive PPI facilitators that let public collaborators know that their contributions, emotional or not, are still valuable. Secondly, by recording all contributions uh, in, for example, minutes can help to acknowledge the different types of knowledge shared and also give weight to the emotional contributions rather than pushing them away because they can seem uncomfortable. Thirdly, it's about having a comfortable environment, both physically, for example, um, in an in-person meeting, for example, um, supplying refreshments and having meetings take place in environments that are more reminiscent of, say, living rooms and comfortable spaces rather than very strict and formal um, boardroom meeting type venues um, and furthermore also the types of clothes that researchers wear um, we tend to try to avoid wearing like suits and things that can seem a little bit intimidating but also through having flexible time frames that can help to create a relaxed and non-judgmental space now you may notice that time frames has an asterisk next to it and that's because um, this particular tip i think is especially useful for uh, ppi researchers in that uh, we think it's good practice to block out a slightly longer uh, time period for a meeting that you can anticipate might be emotional then you end up telling the public collaborators so that you know that you have extra time uh, allotted to account for uh, if anybody needs some extra support um, for having shared something difficult Lastly is about having role descriptions and agreeing on a role description we feel helps to prepare everyone for the different types of knowledge that public members may bring. Um, by this I just mean that uh, it can also be comforting for uh, public collaborators to know precisely what they're there for, especially if they might be new to PPI and may feel overwhelmed or intimidated by the emotional content. But that brings me to the end of my presentation. I just wanted to say thank you again so much for uh, listening. Thank you so much, Lauren. Really, really profound and moving and also really clear um, your, your presentation style. And I, I love the backdrop to your slides. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you raise some really, really important things that so often are not acknowledged 
<laughs> so thank you. Um, you may not yet have seen that people have asked in the chat whether the work is is already published. And um, I think it was Naomi, somebody replied to say it's in the process of being submitted for publication or being reviewed. So it's not available yet, but uh, yeah. soon will be. Um, Thanks. Yeah, you yeah, know, just especially the point in that last slide about um, being in the same physical space and how that has an impact on the emotions in the meeting. A lot of these meetings are now done virtually. So I was wondering what impact that has as well, both in terms of kind of emotions in the meeting, then also perhaps support. Mm. Mm, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you, Ben. And um, not one that's unfamiliar to us either. Uh, I think Naomi will probably agree that the majority of our PPI meetings tend to still take place um, online. Uh, and so the element as far as making sure that you have a comfortable physical space may be different, but the same is still true for the online space. And we tend to do this through activities such as icebreakers at the beginning of meetings. Um, these don't always have to take the form of games. In fact, uh, more recently, we've adopted sort of a traffic light system within our PPI meetings where everybody goes around the room and says, oh, today I feel green, as in good, because or today I feel red um, as in not so good because and that can also take the form of uh, emotional sharing without perhaps oversharing or making people feel too exposed but it can still have that same desirable effect of bringing the group closer together and feeling comfortable in that way so I hope that that answers your question. Yeah that's interesting thanks. Thank you Ben. Thank you so much. Um, Juliet. Hi, um, I had a very similar question to Ben, actually. Um, so it was to do with sort of online meetings. So a lot of our PPI is still done online. So I think it was similar to look at that. But maybe a follow up question to add would be, what do you think uh, and whether did you look at this about having extra support and when you are running an, a meeting? So I can imagine if there is only one PPI facilitator in the room um did you sort of explore what other ways could be useful in sort of providing a separate room for somebody to kind of go away not go away but to go sit in a separate room if they needed to just sort of trying to understand what other strategies can be used uh, especially if you find yourself to be the only facilitator in the room but i think as you alluded to not wanting to rush somebody and to give them the time to sort of process their emotion if that was needed yeah, definitely. Thank you, Juliet. That's um, a really good follow up question. I think the way that we tend to try and account for that in a virtual space would be through particularly having rest breaks um, or comfort breaks rather uh, scheduled into the actual agenda so that people know that they don't have to go huge stretches of time until say the end of maybe a two hour PPI meeting without having had a moment to breathe. Um, but generally speaking, our meetings tend to also be quite flexible. So should anybody indeed feel that they need to maybe take a moment and step back, there's certainly no judgment around doing so. Um, I have also seen um, in other PPI meetings that I've helped with um, where there will be somebody on standby uh, that you can contact within the meeting, perhaps over email or um, maybe through instant chat function to just say, hey, actually, that was quite triggering. That was quite difficult for me. Do you mind if we just pop out and speak for a little bit about that? Um, also, I suppose is kind of a common thing in research is to know that you can leave at any time. There's no um, obligation for you to stay for the whole thing. And we are absolutely understanding of that as well. So I hope that that answers your question as well. Thank you. Sarah, over to you, Fisher, Sarah Fisher. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Fisher, maternity and mental health um, patient public representative. Um, this kind of relates to the suggestions that uh, and ideas that have already been raised, but I've been in sessions particularly around mental health and trauma where um, they have a like brief or debrief session following on where um, you've just been invited to stay on at the end of the call for perhaps an informal chat. 
I don't know whether there are any thoughts about whether that needs to be led by someone trained perhaps, but it can be quite a nice way of kind of almost breaking the ice after the session and wrapping it up in a more informal way rather than a, a cold ending on quite a serious subject. So that's worked well in some sessions. Thank you, Sarah. That's actually a really good point, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, usually at the end of difficult or subjects that you can foresee might be difficult for people. We do try to have something at the very end of the agenda to just go, that was a lot, wasn't it, guys? You know, um, but failing that, we also, um, as a team, like to make sure that we're easily contactable as well. It's not always the case that somebody may want to sort of dive back into it um, on the same day uh, or in the same span of time when they've been through something emotional that they've shared. And so um, it isn't uncommon for us to maybe reach out individually to everybody to go, hey, I've got some time in the diary now. Um, are you free? Do you want to maybe go over some things um, about how that meeting went? Sometimes that can be as, uh, I guess, casual and informal as maybe sense checking. If perhaps we've had maybe a researcher who isn't so experienced in PPI who said a lot of confusing things. But also it can be really useful too for just being an emotional sounding board for people, for people to go, eh, that was really tough. But I think it's comforting for um, public collaborators to know that we are there to listen as well. Um, so I hope Lauren. that, uh, yeah. Yes. Hi, Mary. Lauren, thank, thank you so much. Um, we actually need to stop the Q&A there. Um, they're such rich questions um, and you've answered them beautifully. Uh, thank you again, Lauren, for a fantastic opening presentation. I, I'm, we're going to um, go to our second presentation now. Um, I just wanted to say um, you've all got access to the biographies for our speakers um, and they are well worth reading. Um, I don't want to spend the precious moment saying too much. Um, Kat uh, DeBacca is a, um, a, a really cherished colleague of mine in South London. It's an absolute um, privilege to work with her. Um, and I'm going to let Kat, I'll just say she's a midwife by background, um, doing this important work that she's going to introduce to you. And we're delighted that um, Cassie or Cassandra is, is here speaking with Kat today and putting her perspective as somebody um, who's involved in, in a public involvement advisory group to Kat's study. Um, Cassie, I'll leave you to say more that you, if, if you want to about your own personal background, because I want to give maximum time to the two of you to speak and answer questions. I hope that's okay. Yeah. Um, so over to the two of you, and we very much look forward to your presentation. Oh, thanks, Mary. That was quite the introduction. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm here with um, Cassandra today, which is a real honour that she um, she wanted to do this jointly. Um, I think it's a it's it's an example of how we've tried to do this study as a whole. Um, and um, Cassandra, do you want to uh, chip in and sort of tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm, share my screen. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, Cassandra Newell. I'm part of the Mums at Risk panellists. Um, I'm also a healthcare worker, a mental health and domestic abuse advocate. Um, and I'm just simply speaking from my experience as the panellist at Mum at Risk and as a mum who's had her child removed as well. So the emotional and traumatic story to that. Thank you, Sandra. So, yeah, we will talk about quite upsetting things. Um, and um, I was very pleased to hear Lauren actually putting some really theoretical um, spin on what I think I think I felt was my main driver to do this research um, from my personal wounds, as you described them, Lauren. Um, so I, I'm a midwife and as a midwife, I've seen babies removed on the postnatal ward within a few days after birth. And I always found that an incredibly traumatic 
um, event, um, obviously for the mums involved at the at the forefront, but also for midwives involved, it is an incredibly stressful event. Um, and I found actually there's very little to guide midwives and healthcare professionals to provide the best care for women in those circumstances. And that's what led to um, my NIHR application. So this is a PhD study I'm conducting, funded by the NIHR. And Cassandra and I will do it together. And we've uh, sort of titled this presentation, Giving Birth Mothers a Voice. And we'll give some examples of what we're trying to do with emotions in research in this context um, within the Mums at Risk study. So just to give you a very, very quick background um, to what the aim is of the study, there is an incredible amount of babies every year that end up in care within a week after their birth. And we're looking at about 3,000, depending on what resources you look at, sometimes say even more, 4,000 babies every year in England alone that don't live with their mum within a week after birth because of social care involvement. And we know those incidents have gone up um, and there's huge regional variation. When we look at the mums of these babies, um, they're in the last couple of embrace reports, so they're the reports looking at mums who have died in pregnancy and the year after birth, um, it has been highlighted in the last couple of reports that a huge number of mothers who die by suicide and substance misuse either were known to social services or had their baby removed. We know these mums have often high burdens of mental health difficulties and substance misuse prior to pregnancy. And when a baby is removed, um, a lot of women want to sort of fill that hole um, and that trauma and become pregnant quite quickly again and then have recurrent um, removals and recurrent care proceedings, um, leading to sort of subsequent trauma. And you can see that that endless cycle of uh, grief and loss and trauma. Um, I wanted to understand what those mums are going through in terms of their maternity experiences and their outcomes, in terms of birth outcomes and mental health outcomes of mothers who face removal of their infant due to social care proceedings. And that's what led to the title of the study mums at risk. Um, how I'm doing that, I'm doing systematic review, um, I'm doing some quantitative work with a database, um, I'm doing in-depth interviews with women, and I'm doing focus groups with healthcare professionals in the perinatal time frame. But uh, most of all, along that journey, I have this incredible group of women with lived experience of infant removal, taking every, every step of that journey with me. Um, and I had some fantastic third sector partners that supported me and have supported me and the study from the very, very big beginning. And I've put them all up here. Um, and a special shout out to the Hope Mums, which is an existing group of mothers with lived experience of infant removal that come from some of these organisations prior to um, sort of um, my study. Um, these, these partners are incredibly important because they provide support to women who have had a baby removed or um, sort of women who are very vulnerable um, in very vulnerable positions and might face um, removal of their baby and so there are third sector organizations that can provide additional support when women want to be part of the panel but also when women want to be involved in the study as a research participant and we'll come to that in a second. So we had our first meeting in March, I think, uh, Cassandra. Yeah, um, yeah. And so far they've been online, but I'm hoping that we'll um, have our um, first face to face meeting in a couple of months. Um, and I'll give the floor to Cassandra and I will tell a little bit about our group agreement. <laughs> okay, so we made a group agreement at the first few sessions that we did, when this was basically so that we all knew that we had a safe space. Um, everything that we said we knew was going to be confidential so no one was going to talk about it out of the panellist group. Um, we all knew to be respectful and compassionate and show empathy to everyone's experiences because we was all there for the same reason but with different background stories. Um, it was okay to disagree so we could uh, talk to somebody and disagree with it but as long as we showed them respect that was a brilliant thing we all agreed to. Um, to understand when someone speaks, it's hard enough to speak out. So to just be there and listen, be accountable for our own thoughts and, and judgments, because 
sometimes things aren't always as clear as they seem. So sometimes you might say something and then hear someone else's story and then you think, actually, do you know what? I was wrong. So that was also a good good point of the group. Um, we didn't share contact details outside of the group again. That was for confidentiality in case anybody was like a victim of domestic abuse or anything like that. And also safety plans were put in place. So if anyone had any concerns or any issues while we was in the panelist group meetings, that there was places, um, there was things in place so that we could reach out and get that support and help if it was needed. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, I think one of the pieces that we're most proud of so far is our Charter for Research Engagement. Um, and we spend quite a lot of time in the first few meetings as well. Um, it served, I think, as a point of discussion and to get to know each other better. But what is most important is that we identified common values in the group um, that need to underpin this whole research. This cannot be a study um, that doesn't have the women with lived experience at the heart of everything that we do. And we talked about what that actually means um, because we can say that and then don't really sort of pin that down in what those values are. And it also serves back, especially I think for me as a researcher, I always go back to this document and think, am I really upholding all these values? Um, in every um, part of the study, whether it's in communication to the panel or to research participants, to my supervisors, to the sort of third sector partners. Um, and so it helps me to sort of stay on the top of my toes. Um, Cassie, do you want to sort of chip in with um, some of the yeah. values that are there? Yeah, I mean, the important values, like one of my important ones was being heard, seen and valued because women that go for our experiences are often not heard. We don't get to talk about our experience and we we feel like we've not been listened to or seen. Um, so being part of the panellist um, for Moms at Risk was, it was very empowering for me because I had a voice. Um, I could finally say what needed to be said. I could say what I thought needed to change. Um, being trauma informed as well because not a lot of people know about trauma in the backgrounds and there's a lot of stigma attached so a lot of us found out that we found it hard to speak up because of the trauma and the stigma attached to it all and it also made me feel hopeful because not only did I feel like it's my chance to say something can try and get changes but I didn't feel alone because we was all on the same journey together as a group. Mm, thank you. Um, some things that we also included was accountability and sort of transparency um, and I think that is really important to make sure that there's no hidden agenda. If I say something to the panel that I'm going to get in touch with them on Monday, I, I hold myself accountable to do that. Um, and same with poverty proofing research, I think it is a common practice that people get reimbursed for their time. Um, but I made it um, my uh, sort of like a, a, my, a, a, a high priority to also cover any sort of hidden costs, I think. So when people, for instance, join that, they not just get time for their, uh, that they get reimbursement for their time. But if they use all their mobile data to join an online meeting for two hours, that, that is covered as well. If they have um, any children, that they have hidden childcare costs, um, that that is covered. Um, and um, I think it's important to be very explicit about that. I think it's very, very hard for people to say, yes, I've made actually some costs or my mobile, mobile data has gone for this month because of joining this meeting. People will not tend to say that. So you need to kind of push them and keep pushing them with every meeting that that is still OK if they have, yeah. if their circumstances have changed. So making it really poverty proof. How we put that into practice um, and uh, is, is a good question. I will give you some explicit examples of how we've done that. Um, what we actually do in the group before we start any sessions is we do a well-being check. So we have a scale of zero to ten, zero being the worst, ten being the best. And we will go around and ask everybody for their number. If they want to explain why they feel that number, they're more than welcome to. If they need a call back afterwards from Kat, they're able to get that access. And then again, we do that at the end of the meeting to see if the numbers have altered. 
So again, not only does that also show what might have triggered them because we know what conversations we've had, but it gives Kat the opportunity to contact them back or them to contact Kat if they want any support. Yeah, and I think so far that's that's worked quite well. Yeah. I can feel safe um, that the women on the panel are safe if they've gone from a seven to a nine. I know it was a good meeting and and sort of but vice versa, if it's gone down, it's uh, it rings some alarms for me. In terms of the study design, I cannot um, tell you how much the study has changed over the last year since we've got the panel together um, from the initial. And actually, to be fair, there was um, PPI input in the application stages. But even then, from, from the word get-go to this point, every single aspect of the study still has changed and keeps on changing. Uh, and that's a credit to the women's generous feedback, the critical thinking um, and and how we sort of keep adapting um, the study design. Um, another one that's really important is grounding. So your grounding techniques, I use this a lot when I'm in like as meetings, like things like having a, a comfort blanket or a mental min or breathing exercises and being able to count. They're all things that stimulate your senses so you don't get so overwhelmed and it gives you, it's like a comfort blanket, basically it comforts you and helps you get through the stuff. Mm. Um, and something I mentioned before was about the safety net for both panel members and participants and that's where those the sector parties come into play. So um, for, for the panel members, they have been able to identify the safety person if they've come through sort of, and they all actually have come through one of the uh, partners but especially for research participants, it is actually one of the inclusion criteria that I know they have support available from one of the third sector partners through a practitioner or a buddy, whatever that organisation calls their, um, their staff that can provide one-to-one -one care to women prior, during and or after an interview. And then it basically, the whole the whole way it goes, it gives back control and a voice to the person that's gone through that situation. Um, so basically, we're given the control to say what we need to say and what we feel. And then at the end of it, we also get a transcript that we get to keep what words we've said. And it's, it's just giving us power back. Yeah, so this is a cover of um, the, the, when participants... Um, have shared their story the transcript um, gets a nice cover to soften it and if it's safe to send it to that research participant and I'm saying that if for instance if they're still in a domestic abusive relationship I'm not going to send that to somebody's house because obviously of the confidential and, and sort of quite sensitive content um, but if it's safe to do I send that tract in the post um, so it will arrive at the right address um, and um, it is just a nice um, keepsake I think for for women who have had to share their story in family courts um, or with social services and lost control of that narrative so this is our attempt to give a little bit of that control back in a nice and soft way um, and then the final um, thing that we've put into place is um, reflective supervision um, for, for for myself as a researcher I think there's a lot of um, um, sensitive things I hear that even with the best support of my supervisors and some are here today um, that that is still some, sometimes difficult to process and just as the research participants and the panel members have access to that individual support um, it was important for, 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 for me as a researcher um, especially a, a junior researcher to, to have some safe space to, to process that as well and I think it all comes down to kindness. Um, we talk about emotions in research, but I think in general, um, if we try to embed uh, a bit more kindness in research to our panel members, to research participants, but also to ourselves as researchers, um, that can go a long way. And then some final um, words um, from Cassandra on behalf of our final, oh, our Moms at Risk Advisory panel. Right, okay. <laughs> Um, one of the most important parts for being parts of the Moms at Risk panel for me was actually the fact that I had a space in which, oops, sorry, my phone's just crashed, sorry. <laughs> so I finally had a space in which I could be seen and heard with no judgment and feeling like I wasn't not like worthy of normal treatment. It gave me a voice in which I'd had taken away from me so many times during my experiences. 
So it gave me a chance to say what really happened and how a lot of mothers in our situations get failed because of the lack of support. And we're let down by so many parts of the system, basically. Um, so I was able to feel like my voice was finally important by sharing my story and putting that into something positive that could hopefully change down the line so that women are treated equally and get better care, um, not just for their own lives, but their children's down the future. Because when you're at your lowest, the last thing anyone needs is more poor treatment. Um, so why should it be something that we accept? A lot of people like myself have been through experiences that are traumatic, but it doesn't make us bad people just because we've gone through something traumatic. But we're often seen as monsters in these sorts of situations. So I finally now feel like my story may help to get changes and support for, and not separation so that women can get equal and fair treatment and to be heard and even medical treatment to get the same medical treatment as every other woman that's going through that process. Um, when you meet others that have gone through similar to yourself, you realize that you're also not alone, which is another common feeling in the situation um, because we're often isolated by the system again um, and it's just made me feel so strong and proud to be, to be a part of the panel, um, knowing that it might cause some positive changes, um, to be a part where all women are heard, respected and treated as equals. And most of all, it's the first space that I've actually worked in where I feel like I can trust Kat in the subject. So Kat has made me put so much trust into the Moms at Risk panel, um, and it just shows the difference between when you show empathy and respect and not judgment, because it goes very far on outcomes like this. Because um, someone's treatment, the way you treat someone can make someone or break someone. And when many women that have gone through child removal are often just sent home with a crisis team card and then basically get little to no support after child support, it's, it's a little bit of kindness from a health worker or a midwife that can make the difference in that case. Um, but many just judge people on the paperwork and not the whole situation, which it's very hard for us all to do because when women aren't given the opportunity to speak about it, then communication is broke down. Um, and communication is another big thing that's been brilliant in this panel to be able to discuss in a respectful, caring manner and say what we felt during child removal at birth and what we think could, could help make positive changes to speak about it from my own words it's given me power back um not only give me power but it's helped me to heal as well to have my voice out there um so it's it's been absolutely brilliant to be able to speak honest and open and know that there's other people going around it i'm not being told no or ignored um and basically the main goal is to get some positive changes from it all um so as I'm saying, it's it's to give that treatment that's good treatment rather than ignorance, because as I said, that does make a big difference. And if I didn't feel this way about I do with the Moms at Risk panel because the way catch treatment's been, I, I honestly don't think I would have any hope for anybody else left in the future. And that's quite the sad reality of it all is that we do need positive changes and it's it's going to make other people's horrific experiences that a little bit more bearable if we do thank, thank you so, you much, so much thank you that is from the heart you can see it <laughs> um, and thank you for joining me today Cassandra I know it was a very big ask um <laughs> too long, but I'm so grateful to you and I'm thank so you. grateful for everybody listening um to the work that we do together and thank you for the invitation Mary and Naomi Cassandra and Kat, thank you so, so much. That was incredibly moving. And, you know, I've, I'm just, the words that you spoke, um, Cassie, really resonate. It's given me power back and helped me to heal. And, um, you know, we've got this focus on getting positive change. It's such an impressive presentation that you've both given, the, the practical technical stuff about how to do public involvement well and to uh, really put emotions at the centre, to remind us about the power and importance of kindness. Um, it's so powerful. But, you know, the practical stuff about how to do that 
um, I'm sure we'll all take away. And um, lots of people I can see have, have acknowledged the presentation. Thank you again. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, so uh, Mandy, Mandy Cheatham, you've got the difficult job of following that presentation, um, but I'm sure you will bring another um, perspective and huge experience with you. Uh, I'll again remind people to look at biographies. It's fantastic, Mandy. Uh, coming from the Northeast, you did your PhD in Newcastle. You're working uh, at Northumbria University now. But I know you've worked in public health, the NHS, regional government and the third sector. So a really good range of um, stakeholder organisations. And that's that's so important, too, because, you know, we need to influence all of these sectors if we're going to improve services. Um, so, Mandy, um, without further ado, I shall hand over to you. That's great. Thank you, Mary. And thank you um, to you and Naomi for the invitation and to Felicity Shenton, who I think had a, a say in this as well, and to the speakers so far that have been really amazing. I've also uh, learned a lot. So thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, I've called the presentation Feeling Our Way in Research. Um, and I'm going to be speaking kind of from the perspective as a researcher, drawing on um, studies that I've done into the mental health effects of universal credit, which is a, um, a benefit that most of you will know about for working age adults and people on low incomes in the UK. Um, my job has recently changed, so I'm, I, I was a research fellow in the North East and North Cumbria, and I am now uh, very recently an assistant professor in health and social care research, so I'm still getting used to introducing myself in that way. But I thought um, I would start with a, um, a, a bit of a, a kind of introduction to uh, myself and the approach that I take to um, the work that I do around public involvement. And I was, um, I had a very brief email exchange with somebody who's on the call, who does work, her work is much more focused on women and maternal health. And she wrote something in an email, which I then asked her if I could use, um, which you can see on the screen. We certainly see a lot of emotions during our PPI sessions. And I think our starting point or my starting point is really to acknowledge that feelings are a really welcome and important part, both of research and of public involvement and engagement processes. And we've heard some really brilliant examples of those um, so far, but that actually researchers and public partners both have feelings which affect research. It's not, uh, uh, we are all human. And I've seen some comments in the chat to that effect. And sometimes we all need support from others to have both identify and manage those and that it, it's important to be kind of honest about those feelings and how how they affect our work but also the values underpinning our approach to um ppi or pie as i call it um in the universal credit study and i really loved the the charter for research engagement engagement that um cat introduced because that seemed to be a very explicit statement of, of the values that had been co-developed with the group. Um, so my um, research, much of my research is um, political and I believe that public involvement in research is political. And this quote is from a, a blog that I wrote uh, with a colleague who's also a research fellow, Jenny Little from the Northeast, um, about influence, using research to influence policy. and. I I feel very passionately about using our research findings to influence policy change. Um, and so that does, if that is our role to help frame the debate and challenge misinformation and change attitudes and present alternative policy options, it does raise questions, as Naomi said right at the very beginning, about how that sits with us as independent, impartial or objective researchers. And I think we need to engage in those discussions and challenge some of the ideas that um, there are such things as objective uh, researchers, because I'm not sure I've ever met one. I'd be interested to hear whether others have. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the NIHR funded study that um, 
I'm doing evaluating the mental health effects of universal credit. So I'm one of the co-leads for the Quali research um, package. It's a pleasure to work with a brilliant team of researchers, uh, Steph Morris from Newcastle University, Marcia Gibson from Glasgow University, and the study is um, led by Peter Craig from Glasgow and Claire Bambra from Newcastle University that some of you may know. Um, we take, um, I think, a partnership approach and we see public involvement and engagement in the study as a social practice with a really firm commitment to social justice at the heart of it. And we have um, made that an explicit part of our, the values underpinning our public involvement and engagement activities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we've, how we do what, what we do and the use of arts in our public involvement activities um, and give you some examples. So I guess the first thing to say is that we view public involvement as a, as a human right and that we try and um, use people's suggestions effectively and take them into account. So it's important to listen to people, but it's also important to act on their suggestions for the conduct of research and that there are many different ways for people to be involved but some of our approach is inspired by um, colleagues from Gateshead Poverty Truth Commission who are who um, are still involved some of whom are still involved in the um, study as public partners and their approach is very much about uh, linking people with lived experience with decision makers in positions of power um, potentially to influence um, in this case policy. So we've um, we've tried to translate those um, principles into practice. It was really interesting to see um, some of the similarities between um, the approach that we take. And, and again, we've tried to kind of set the tone from the beginning, recognise that the people who are joining our public engagement activities come with a huge diversity of skills, knowledge and experience. And we, we also don't assume that researchers themselves may not have relevant experience on which to draw and that is welcome in those discussions as well and we try to value and acknowledge and reward contributions in different ways and we will because this is an NIHR funded study we do use NIHR guidance about um, payment and remuneration because of the <clears throat> complexities which we could have a whole session on the complexities of paying people um, who are in receipt of universal credit, we we offer people choices about uh, how that's done and negotiate very closely with them to avoid any um, adverse impact on their either their financial situation or their eligibility or their um, interactions with their work coaches. So those are those are care carefully negotiated um, sets of arrangements and what has become very clear is that one size doesn't fit all um I'm, I'm not I won't say I won't read the whole list but I think the other thing for me that's been really important is that we have tried to be really flexible about our public involvement opportunities and many of the things that we identified that we thought we might do at the beginning of the study um we have done but there have been other opportunities that have emerged and we've developed with our public partners who have particular skills um, in, in the arts, for example, um, a range of other opportunities. And we are, I think it's important to say, learning through this process. I'm not an expert on public involvement. Um, I, I feel like we're on a journey together and we are open to feedback and, um, and uh, learning throughout this process. So some of the things that we've done um, include um, a theatre production called Credit that I'll talk a little bit more about. We've also had um, people involved in uh, staff recruitment, in the usual data collection tools and, and some of the early qualitative data analysis. Um, one of our public partners um, wrote about their experiences of talking, presenting at a conference and one fuses the Centre for Translational Research in public health that I know some people on the call will be very familiar with um, and one of our public partners David Black won a, um, a FUSE award for uh, for the blog that he wrote. We've tried to um, 
include people in in some of our early dissemination activities um, on Monday, Monday coming, we have a meeting with DWP staff to share some of the findings that relate specifically to children, young people and families. And that's, um, that's a, again, a new, much more kind of relational approach for us that we're aiming to build relationships, long standing relationships with colleagues in DWP to share some of the um, discussion of the findings and agree together how changes in practice might they might be able to implement some of those. Um, we've also uh, contributed to an all party parliamentary group report and um, co facilitated workshops, for example, at the UK Knowledge Mobilisation Forum um, last year. And I am going to talk a little bit more about the UC Creatives project, which was a co produced participatory arts project that um, has been happening. And Steph, I need to acknowledge um, Steph Morris has led that project and she secured the funding for that project. But um, before I get into that, I just wanted to share um, a poem that one of our public partners presented at the UK Knowledge Mobilisation Forum, because I think um, he has very uh, particular skills as a poet and what he's been able to share with us and um, his uh, the other public partners that are involved are his experience through the medium of poetry and uh, in some ways I wish he was here to to read this poem because it's much more powerful than he does but he was able to share this with um, academics and PhD students early career researchers at the conference last summer which was which was really powerful and we have also published this poem in an academic paper so we're trying I guess to move some of the parameters about um, what what is uh, what you would normally expect to see in a in a published paper? We've also worked with an amazing writer and theatre company. So the writer is Laura Lindau, and she took some of the findings from our um, earlier quali study about the impacts of universal credit and wrote a very powerful and moving play, which we were just at the point of. Um, showing live performances were just about to start and COVID struck. So we did a um, rehearsed, a film of a rehearsed reading and uh, an invited panel discussion. And you can see from the uh, responses of the audience that um, it was a very powerful and moving experience for people. And one of the comments was that we, um, we don't use uh, the arts enough in public health and somebody had expressed their desire for um, projects like this to find their way into the training of NHS practitioners more routinely. Um, so we are hoping to secure further funding um, for an updated version of a live performance of the, of the play to happen. Um, I would really encourage you, if you have the chance, to have a look at the UC Creatives exhibition, which was launched this summer. Um, the website there is an online exhibition but we also have um, a, a touring exhibition which actually Steph is taking to a group of mental health professionals in the west end of Newcastle this Friday um, but the quotes that you can see on the left are from some of the participants who've been involved in that process so seven participants um, who have experience of claiming and living on universal credit got involved and um, many I was thinking as Cassandra was talking, I was thinking the motivations of many of the people who we're working with are to ensure that the universal credit system is much better geared up to meet the needs of um, people in all sets, all sorts of different sets of circumstances. Um, but actually the process of involving people in some of those discussions has also been really powerful in and of itself. And I think that's a it's a really important point that getting our public involvement activities right can also be health enhancing. Um, it, can, it can also <laughs> run the risk of generating either unanticipated or more challenging emotions, either in us as researchers or in our public partners. And we try similarly to create spaces where people can talk about some of those um, more tricky emotions and I I really uh, it was I think it's really important to talk about um 
how we measure change as a result of our public involvement activities, but sometimes that's really difficult to do because the um, the changes that happen um, might be really subtle or they might change the course of a discussion in really subtle but quite hard to measure ways. Um, I did, I wanted to say something about um, anger as well as an emotion. I think when we're working in areas like uh, welfare reform in what can sometimes feel like a very um, difficult or a toxic polit political environment, actually anger mobilization may be a legitimate strategy. And there's a, um, a really nice paper that I've included in the references, um, which focuses specifically on anger in relation to health inequalities and cha maybe changing some of the language that we use um, around uh, the acceptability of um, health and social inequalities. Um, we have um, similarly tried to introduce ways of looking after each other. And we also, we have weekly team meetings and we start our team meetings with a round of um, how are we and how's the work and people can choose to, to opt into those discussions at whatever level works for them. Um, but I, I think it's also some of the, the really practical tools that help manage our working weeks when we're dealing with um, emotional material. I, I don't take the view that there are particular topics which can be emotionally demanding or sensitive. I think any research topic can be depending on um, who's doing it and how they how they feel and how they relate to that topic. But we have taken or tried to take steps to limit the um, uh, the potential risks for um, for those difficult emotions to be um, managed and put in place safeguarding and distress protocols and encourage kind of peer support and opportunities to to have open conversations about how those those feelings are. Um, we had as part of that we had a session. Some people on the call will recognise um, the slides from in the northeast of North Cumbria. We have um, practice fellows who are people who work in um, in practice who are seconded into research organizations universities to do to do research um, and one of ours Leila Moffrad um, who works in mental health did a great session for us around self-care and managing our emotions as researchers and she talked about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs so as both as researchers and public partners, we need to look after ourselves um, in order to get to the, um, the point where we can maybe develop and reflect on our work. Um, but that requires that we recognize that we need to look after ourselves and, um, and look out for when there's a stronger response that might, might affect our day-to-day -day life. And that that kind of focus on self-care, which some people might, see as a bit of a luxury is actually a really fundamental part about um, being able to hear those stories and, um, and, and looking after ourselves in that process. So um, yeah, thanks to, to Leila and colleagues at CNTW for those helpful tips. Um, I'm gonna stop there. There are lots of references on that slide um, at which people can follow up and I'm really happy I have no sense of time I'm really sorry I often talk far too much so I hope I haven't overrun too much. Mandy thank you so much that was a wonderful presentation and brought elements to our discussion today that we haven't had sort of until now I think having the political uh, is so important and to uh, address the the whole issue of of people on universal credit or other benefits and and the importance of um hearing a whole range of voices including those people who are struggling with um fewest resources is so important um we've just got a couple of minutes for finishing up the most important thing or one of the most important things is to ask you all please to um give us feedback on today's um, webinar. Um, Naomi's going to put the link to the feedback form in the chat. Uh, if you could give us a few minutes 
to tell us what you've found useful. That would be fantastic. Um, we do want to continue providing support and signposting and to work towards finding the most appropriate ways to create a sort of standing community of practice for people who want to be in touch with other people doing public involvement in research and to make it relevant and welcoming for individual public members who are on a research advisory group for people leading up on PPI, public involvement that is, and, and academics working in this area, because we, we recognise here we can all learn from each other. And thank you for your contributions throughout these three webinars, and particularly today. Um, I hand over to Naomi for your comments. Thank you so much, Mary. I just would like to say a very big thank you to Mary, who has been working with me on this, putting these together, being so patient with me. Um, also to Felicity um, coming in and helping us, putting a, a fantastic set of speakers together. And yes, thank you to our speakers and um, giving you up your time, your insights, your perspectives. It has been immensely helpful. And I think it is so important to have a community where you can share the learning and the challenges um um the good the bad and the ugly um it's it, it looks like a wide field very uh lonely out there sometimes so it's good to see faces and just to hear what other people are doing um so yes we will continue our learning and it would be great to hear from you to continue to hear from you um the um children's health and maternity program will continue uh to be funded uh, for a little bit longer so we're looking to share um more often um so it'd be great to hear what you think so everything that you said today thank you for putting things in the chat and just now in the great um breakout rooms it will be going into our reports and um we'll add to our learning thank, thank you, you so much everybody thanks bye-bye so now bye-bye <laughs>